as we get started, I want to just read something quickly from Jeremiah, just just a, a little something to frame our time. I'll pray for us and then we'll, we'll jump in. You know, one of the things we're inviting you to do is to think differently about relationships. And I'm, I'm working from the assumption that what currently is, is not working. Okay. It is not helpful. It is not godly. It is not leading us to flourishing marriages, flourishing families, etc. And so in some ways, much like I challenged you here last night, we got to go upstream. We just got to think differently about this. And if it was all awesome, I wouldn't waste your time by walking through this. Okay. But one of the things that strikes me is in Jeremiah 6, verse 16, Jeremiah says this, thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. What I'm inviting you into is to think old fashioned about relationships. Bless you. I fully understand that I'm asking you to do something that was like taught to your grandparents, you know, 50 years ago. Um, but new is not necessarily better. And if what we were doing was better, again, we wouldn't waste your time. So we're going to go back. We're going to talk about the ancient ways. What I want to do tonight is cover dating. And depending on how you feel, we'll talk about courtship a little bit as well. Uh, it would help me, by the way, if somebody could put me on the clock. You got me? Just, yeah, okay, great. Just give me like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Just that way I'm not like an hour and people are sleeping. Can you do that? Well, let's see how you feel in 45 minutes. That's great. That's great. All right. So, God, we are grateful. And we, we want the ancient paths. We, we want what the old and good way is. We want to walk in it because we want, we want rest for our souls. Father, we're exhausted because we, for many of us, at least have bought into what the world said. And it gave us nothing but shame and regret, mouthfuls of gravel, tear-stained pillows, broken hearts, shattered lives. God, we want something different. And we come with our brokenness asking for you to make the way straight for us that we can see maybe what your plan might be and that you would give us the courage by the power of the Spirit of God that is in us. Give us the courage to actually walk this out. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's, uh, let's jump in. We'll talk dating. We're going to start in uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Um, you know, when you look at the dating scene, by and large, it, it's kind of fascinating because it, it's got its own ecosystem it's got its own language. Um, it, it's got all of these like buzzwords that describe absolutely nothing meaningful. Uh, oh, we're hanging out. We're just talking. We're just friends. All of these things, by the way, designed in many ways to give you all of the benefits of a relationship with none of the actual responsibilities. And what I'd like to do is maybe walk through it with another perspective and say, well, what would it look like for us, for us to actually lean in and say, well, Lord, what, what do you want for relationships? And what would it look like for me to do so in a way that honors you? And in so doing, we're going to talk a lot about patterns. I'm really committed to the idea of patterns in that, um, fellas, if you don't learn to lead, then you'll never learn how to be a husband. Ladies, if you can't allow a man to lead, it's going to make it very difficult for a marriage. And so I want to talk about that because I think as we date and as we spend time in courtship, we are training ourselves for what's next. We're preparing ourselves for marriage. And if we date in a way that is outside of God's design, what we're actually doing is training ourselves to divorce. Because if we're attracted based on looks, and then years later, looks don't last, you got to really like that person anymore. And so you divorce, we're, we're training ourselves, we're setting ourselves up for that. And so uh, as you look here at the, uh, the text, as we start in verse 8, we're going to talk about dating. But I want to set something up first in that. A dating relationship, any relationship by and large, has three aspects to it. An emotional aspect, a uh, spiritual aspect, and a physical aspect, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, and think of it this way. Think of it like a sliding scale of intimacy. So talk emotionally. You're either emotionally really shallow or emotionally really intimate. You're either spiritually really shallow or spiritually really intimate. Physically, you get the point. Here, here's the thing. Emotionally now, and, and the culture pushes for emotional intimacy, wants you to be intimate, encourages candlelight dinners, romantic dances, flower petals on the floor, you know, you name it. It's pushing for intimacy. And in many ways, we get into relationships and that's what happened. We're, we're sharing in depth. We're sharing our hearts. We're talking about, I love you. We're uh, talking about deep, intimate things. And that just rockets that slider all the way over to intimate from emo an emotional standpoint. And then there's a spiritual component. Now, Unfortunately, we're confused sometimes on how to handle a relationship as a believer with a believer 
And unfortunately, we start thinking that intimacy is good. I just want to tell you, intimacy is not your friend in a dating relationship. You don't need it. In fact, you're not even prepared for that yet. And so what happens spiritually is we start praying together. We start reading our Bible together. We start confessing sin together. You're over an intimate, okay? But as believers, we're like, but I want the physical to stay shallow. Here's what you need to know. All three of those are connected like links in a chain. You cannot be uh, emotionally intimate. You cannot be spiritually intimate and expect your physical to be shallow. So one of the reasons you may struggle, if that's the pattern in your previous relationships, one of the reasons you may struggle has nothing to do with your boundaries. Nothing laying down, nothing, you know, uh, nothing below the neck, nothing comes off. Like you can get super creative and still cross boundaries even with those things. It's not the boundaries that are the problem. The problem is you didn't realize that intimacy was pulling you uh, physically along as well. And so when we realize that, it changes the way we begin to pursue relationships. And the problem, right, is if you cross those boundaries in a dating relationship and then break up, which some of you have experienced heartbreaking breakups. I mean, just gut-wrenching stuff. It's really not just a breakup because you've been emotionally intimate. You've been spiritually intimate. You've been physically intimate. It's not like a breakup. Now it feels like a divorce. And so what's happening is many young people are now getting married for the first time, having experienced the pain of divorce multiple times already. It wasn't officially a divorce, but the more you give yourself away emotionally, the more you give yourself away spiritually, the more you give yourself away physically, the less you have to give to your spouse. So I want you to rethink this idea of intimacy. It's a commodity that is so treasured and so special. If you give it away to everyone, one day when you stand to get married, you will have nothing you need to offer. Now, that's a different way to look at it because the world says, yeah, well, I mean, you should be totally sleeping together. What if it's bad sex? Well, you're, you're missing the point completely because if you save yourself for marriage and you don't have sex until you're married, that will be the best sex you've ever had for the rest of your life with no frame of comparison. But the world's not going to tell you that. So we're talking about going back to the ancient paths. Now, I would like to tell you in a breakup situation that we learned our lessons, right? We got emotionally intimate. We got physically intimate. We got spiritually intimate. We broke up. We're like, wow, that was sucked. I'm never doing that again. But the reality is, is because we attract based on looks, we end up just going right back to the same old patterns. And the proper becomes true in our life. Like a dog returns to its vomit. So a, a fool returns to its folly. And so we're just wanting to show now another way, lest we do it again and again and again. And again, well, as you look at verse eight, uh, this couple is going to now begin to spend time together. And as they spend time together, um, one of the things that is, uh, is happening at the bottom there of verse seven is uh, she's going to ask an, an interesting question. She says, tell me, oh, you who my soul loves, where do you pasture your flock and where do you make it lie down in noon, at noon? One of the things that happens as they're being attracted and as they begin to spend time together, she initiates time with him. Now, let me let me deal with a question that I hear often. Is it wrong for a girl to initiate with a boy? Because this looks like she's initiating. Let me play that out for a second. One of the things that I think we're dealing with in our culture that is unique is a manhood problem. I think we've got prolonged adolescence. I think we've got boys that are still dependent on mom and dad to do their basic necessities. And I think we've got boys that have become very accustomed to going passive. They just let mom lead and they'll let you lead, ladies, and they'll let anybody else lead as long as they can play Xbox. And so part of the thing that I would uh, caution you on, ladies, is if you're going to begin to initiate with a boy, what you need to understand is if you initiate, he never will. And he has to learn how to be a man, which means he has to learn to put himself out there. He has to learn to take the initiative. He has to learn to take the risk. He has to learn to get shot down. He has to learn to put himself out there and not know the result. And, you know, we're living in a culture where we're hedging our bets. Like a guy will find out from all of the girlfriends whether this girl likes him or not before he ever declares his intentions, which means he's risked nothing. He just did good recon and then went where the evidence was. And I just think we, we need to help boys rise up and become men. And so I'm not a fan of girls initiating um, with boys because I think it prolongs this adolescence and in many ways creates a, a bad pattern. And the game has changed, by the way. So like years ago, when I was in high school, uh, there was a girl I had dated. Her name was Casey Nixon. 
and I called her house and her dad answered the phone because there was a thing called a landline where dad answered the phone and you were always at risk at any point dad could pick up the phone and listen into your conversation. So there, there was really not a lot of privacy happening. Now, Casey wasn't home. His, uh, Bill answered the phone and says, uh, I said, can I talk to Casey? Oh, she's not here. I said, well, this is Brad. We just have her call me. And he goes, oh, Brad, my daughter doesn't call boys. I remember in that moment thinking, what, what is this, like the Flintstones? What, is, what, what in the world doesn't call boys? And to be candid, he was brilliant because what he was doing was protecting his daughter, allowing her to be pursued and forcing me to be a man. Just on a side note, he just died. I'm doing his funeral here next weekend. So really kind of come full circle, a sweet, sweet thing. But that being said, guys, we got to raise up. Remember the definition for manhood, reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously. And so ladies, I would highly discourage you from reaching out. But now uh, you don't have a landline to call, you can text. You can, you know, you can find other messaging means by which to communicate. And so girls, you are at a disadvantage in that you have no protector in that. If he gets your number, he can get a hold of you. And I just want you to be mindful of that. You have to steward that well. I mean, I'm raising two daughters, as I've mentioned. They have cell phones. Boys can reach out to their cell phones. I'm just not a fan of that. I'm not locking it down. I'm not saying it's, it's not allowed, especially, you know, as they get older. But you have to understand the patterns that are being created. And anything you can do to encourage him to lead uh, would be highly recommended long term. And ladies, it also teaches you to be the prize. You get to be pursued. You get to be the treasure. Uh, you get to guard your heart. We'll talk why that's important here in just a little bit. Uh, you get to respond to godly leadership. Uh, you get to remain safe. Now, it's, it's countercultural. Uh, my oldest, uh, when she got into high school, the first dance her freshman year at Clovis North was Sadie Hawkins. What do you think I said to that? That's a hard, no stinking way. I'm going to have my freshman girl go find a boy and ask him. Do you know that, by the way, do you know that the history of Sadie Hawkins? I was so curious. I looked it up. Apparently it was a cartoon, an old cartoon of a homely girl who couldn't find a suitor. So the dad orchestrated a holiday in her honor. They did a foot race at this event and whoever lost had to marry his daughter. So that's how Sadie Hawkins started. But here, here's the point in that whoever lost had to marry the daughter. Yeah, take that. And so here, here's the point with that. This, this concept of girls initiating, and, and I'm all for strong women. You've heard me say that. You need to be strong, powerful, dynamic women. Okay, this does not put you in an apron making cookies. That's not what I'm saying. You get to be strong, but you also get to be the one that's pursued and allow him uh, to initiate. So is it wrong uh, to initiate with him? I would say you've got to be careful. But what she seems to do here is she puts herself in the position to meet a godly man. And so she just wants to be with him. I told the story last night of my wife uh, cleaning that coffee shop with us. That's exactly what this is. And in fact, you'll notice here, this woman wants to know where uh, he's going to be. But notice now, she says, uh, where do you make it lie down at noon? For why should I be like one who veils herself by the flocks of her companions? Do y'all remember the story of Judah and Tamar? Old Testament, yeah, with me, okay. So Judah, right, uh, goes and he sees this woman who's, whose face is veiled, a prostitute. He sleeps with her, come to find out it's his daughter-in-law. Very, very weird story. Uh, but what this text means is, girls, you can compromise on a lot of things, but you can't compromise your character. She says, I would like to spend time with you. I will go where you're going to be, you and assumed in this others, but I am not going to be like those girls who veil themselves. She's got her boundaries. She's got her standards. And she's not going to compromise those things uh, for this guy. And so she's made decisions ahead of time, by the way. Can I just be in, uh, candid with you? If your uh, boundaries are decided in the moment, you're dead. Because it will always feel right in the moment. So some of you, uh, I think we're reading Daniel. I heard somebody was reading Daniel, the early parts of Daniel. Daniel and the boys made a decision early on. We will do this. We will not do that. We will eat this. We will not eat that. We will participate in this. We will not participate in that. Before it all goes down, they just decide ahead of time. And I would just encourage you, you've, you've got to know what you stand for, know what you're willing to do, know what you're not willing to do, know what you're willing to wait for and why. Because again, in the moment, and you're going to see it here in just a bit, uh, it will always feel right. 
Now here in my home, uh, as I've been raising my daughters, I just said to them, hey, look, girls, you are, you are not allowed to date. And the reason you're not is because you could just tell your friend your dad's an ogre, but secretly, whenever you're ready, let's talk about it. But so that you don't have to have the conversation with boys, if they say they want to date you and you're not ready, you just say, I'm so sorry, my dad is an absolute jerk. He said no, and I'll take that. And what I said to them is, when you think you're ready, when you know what you stand for, and when you know what you're looking for, you just let me know, and I'll give you the green light. And in that, it's been really awesome. My youngest uh, actually has a boyfriend right now, which is kind of crazy. No, he does not honk. He comes to the door, he greets her, he called me, he took me for a walk before he ever asked her out. The boy has done it right. Best first boyfriend I could ever ask for my 17 year old. Uh, and I think in some ways he's listened to this. And so with that in mind, he, you might say, this is kind of overkill, isn't it? All, all of this like raising of the tension. And I would say this, there's nothing more exhilarating than a life-giving relationship. And there's few things more painful than a relationship gone bad. So let's talk now about dating. What, what is a date? I would say this, uh, a date is a noun. You can call it a verb, meaning you, you go on a couple of dates, like we're dating kind of, uh, but, but I want to make a distinction between like, we've dated a little bit versus we've dated like all four years of high school. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit, but it's non-emotional. It's non-escalating. It's non-physical. It's just the two of you enjoying time together in one another's company. It's casual it's relaxed, it's fun. Now, why would I go through all the effort to define a date? Because I'm gonna make the argument, I think you ought to date a lot of people. And if dating is this, then that's totally cool. But if dating means you're getting all crazy in the backseat of a car, that's not what I'm talking about. If it's non-physical, non-escalating, and non-emotional, I think you should date a lot of people because one of the things you're doing right now is developing a theology of relationship. Who are you? And what are you looking for? Like, I, I can think back. There were several gals I dated after I trusted Christ. They were great gals. One was super fancy. I'm not. One was uh, a Russian supermodel. True story. Russian supermodel. But she wanted to be a missionary in Russia. I did not. Those experiences were really helpful for me to kind of wrestle with what kind of girl I needed. I, I dated some serious girls. And I realized that would be no fun because I'm way too serious. And so I needed somebody playful, somebody creative, um, somebody that was pretty casual, somebody that was fun and spontaneous. And if you ever meet my wife, you go, that's my wife. She's perfect. By dating a lot of people in a proper way, you begin to develop that theology of relationship. Well, verse eight, now he speaks and he says, if you yourself don't know most beautiful among women, go forth to the trail of the flock and pasture your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. And he it sets up now a meeting with this girl. And they begin to spend time together. In verses 9 and 10, you'll notice it grows a little in intimacy. It says, uh, to me, my darling, you are like a mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of beads. As he speaks of her, what you're going to hear is affirmation, and you're going to hear uniqueness. He's acknowledging that there's a lot of, to be the mare among the chariots of Pharaoh, by the way, fellas, don't call her a horse. That's not what it means. It means that of all the horses in Egypt, the mare that pulled a Pharaoh's chariot was uh, precious, was unique, and stood out among the rest. And so what he's saying to her is there's a lot of other ladies that are out there, but there's something about you that's just different. Something about you that's just special. It's sweet, it's non-manipulating, etc. cetera. Um, worth noting, by the way, that if you look back historically, most of the creatives were men. Most of the poets in the early days were men. Most of the, uh, the authors were men. Um, and you could argue because men were platformed, and that is 100% true. Uh, but what I want you fellas to understand is they spoke the language of the heart. They knew how they felt. They could articulate how they felt. Where in today's culture, you know, we tend to be kind of Neanderthals, kind of monosyllabic. You know, how was your day? Fine. How was work? Good. Like, talk to me, okay? You're going to notice, fellas, and I want to push you into this. This man knows how to communicate. This man's entering into a relationship in a way that is very life-giving uh, for this woman. Now, they spend time together, and uh, we're going to see a few principles of how they begin now today. Verse 11. Uh, it says, We will make for you now ornaments of gold with beads of silver. These daughters of Jerusalem speak. Again, public affirmation of this relationship. And then what you're going to see is they're going to begin to now spend time together. 
And before they, we, we get into where they are, though, it's important noting that in verse 11, you see these daughters of Jerusalem affirming the relationship. Two principles I want you to think about. One is these, these two date in community. They stay connected to community. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. To date in community is wise. Have you all seen friends of yours? Maybe you were the one who, who was uh, what I call a magician, where like you're all in community until you start to date and then you just, you just disappear. It's like, where'd they go? And like, ah, oh, she got a boyfriend. And then all your homegirls are still hanging out until you break up with said boy. And then you come back, I'm sorry. And then your friends hopefully welcome you back in. Can I just encourage you, don't do that. There's no need for you to disappear. Why do you need to disappear? The reason most couples disappear is they want intimacy. They don't want accountability. And one of the greatest gifts you can do for your relationship is stay in community. Because look, your friends know you. And your friends are getting to know him or her. And if your friends are really friends, then they're going to be a good check for you to go, hey, I don't know if this guy's good for you. Or, hey, this guy makes you better. Right? Isn't that sweet? That, and that's kind of what you want. So date in community. Date in community. Second thing that you see is that they're going to spend time together in very interesting places. Look at verse 12. Where are they in verse 12? On a couch. Anybody have a different translation? I don't like couch. <laughs> Anybody have a different one? He's reading like an NLT Bible. That's not even really a Bible. Not teas. Not teas. Uh, mine says table. It's translated either couch or table. So he's at a table. Yeah. In verse 17, where are they? Yeah, that's right. Uh, bees of a house. What, what, what type though? Cedars? Cedar. Cypresses. If the beams of your house are cedars and cypresses, don't think about this. They didn't build houses like this where they're from. They built houses in stone. What are your houses if it's, if it's cedars and cypresses? Where are you? Are you inside? No, where are you? You're outside. You're, you're out maybe on a picnic. You're out in a field. You're out in a forest, if you will. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Where are they? They're in a banqueting house. So they, they dated in community and they date in public. They date in public. One of the things I want you to see is that as intimacy grows, these people stay in public. And you say, why would they stay in public? That seems kind of weird. I don't want to stay in public. Well, can I just give you a, maybe a practical sort of example? I've been working with college students for a long, long time. Started doing college ministry in 1994. Okay, that's like old school, old school. And I tell you what, every so often a couple comes into my room, or into my office rather, and they're like, oh my gosh, you're crying. I go, what happened? Oh, we crossed boundaries. You know, I go, where were you? They're like, well, we were at home. Okay, well, what were you doing at his apartment when his roommates were gone? Or we were at our house and my parents were gone. It's like, okay, so you were alone. You're behind closed doors alone. You know what I've never heard when the couple comes in, they're crying. And I go, what happened? They go, one thing led to another. I go, well, where, where were you? And they said, we were at Starbucks. But then suddenly. <laughs> or or we, were at, we were at like IHOP and he got the blueberry syrup. But I don't know what happened. I was just, I don't know. I've never heard that. I do know. And yet, here's the irony. If I asked you to evaluate your relationships and do you spend time as a dating couple in public or in private, almost all of you are in private. And boy, you're all crazy. You have no idea the line of the flesh that is inside of you. Romans 7, 18 says, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. The willing is present. The doing of the good is not. And so you're, you're literally playing, you're playing with fire without the proper context to handle the passion and you expect that somehow you're different, you're not different. By the way, what's the number one question asked in relationships? It's the same in your youth group as it was every other place in the country. Say it again. How far is too far? That's like taking a gun and saying, how close can I get it? I mean, I'm just curious, right? Why would we do that? Well, because we're just not thinking. We're not being wise. We're not being discerning. We're thinking in flesh and we're thinking like our culture. So if you date in community and you date in public, um, do you think that the chances are higher or lower that you fall physically? Much lower. 
So my wife and I, as we dated, we were spending time in Denton, Texas. And there was a county courthouse in the center of town, kind of an old school southern town, one-way streets going all the way around it, you know, like a awful pizza joint, a little coffee shop and whatever. And, and we would go down there and I'd throw a blanket out there and we would hang out there. Now, it was private by means of nobody could hear us, but everybody could see us. And so sure enough, we'd hear beep, beep, and here would come one of her girls driving by, waving at us, you know. Ten minutes later, you hear, you look over, one of my buddies swinging their shirt out the window, you know, driving by. But we dated in community and we dated in public. And we were never alone until our wedding night. And we never struggled physically in that regard because we were in public and we were in community. Because, and don't, don't get me wrong, it's not because we're holy, it's because we're honest. I wasn't convinced that I would stop the track record of my flesh in the past. I wasn't convinced I would stop, but now I'm in Christ. And I've been crucified with Christ. I'm now, according to the will of God, I have to handle my uh, sexuality and sanctification and honor. Not unless so passionate like those who don't know God. And so I said, well, you know what? I'm just not going to go, not going to put myself in a situation where I could compromise. Well, as we continue to move through the text, look at now verse uh, 12. While the king was at his uh, table, my perfume gave forth his fragrance. My beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh, which which lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. What, what does that mean? Well, th there's a very interesting difference between um, what happens when a guy goes on a date, or maybe better said, comes home from the date, and when the girl comes home from the date. So um, when the guy comes home from the date, he walks in, and his roommate's like, how was it? He's like, it's good. And then they go play Xbox. And that's it. Like, that's it. They're not going to talk about anything. They're not worried about anything. She comes home and all of her girls are like, they don't, they don't, they don't, I want it all, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, it was great. He took me to this really nice restaurant. We both reached for the salt at the same time. Ah, everybody's freaking out. So I'm exaggerating, but, but it's close. Is it not? It's close. And you replay the tapes. It, this simply means that she's thinking about him long after she was with him. His fragrance, what he said, how he acted. She's replaying the tapes. She has a mind to remember those details. Men don't. And so she's processing it. It means her heart is moving towards him. And here's what you need to understand. If I use a scale again, like zero being what's your name and 10 being let's have a bunch of kids and get married. If, if fellas, if you're like a three, what this text is saying to me is she's a five. And if you're a five, she's a seven. And if you're a seven, she's bought the dress. Be because she's farther along than you are, which is why, ladies, you cannot date a boy. Because a boy will manipulate that. The boy will talk about, man, I've always wanted to meet a girl like you. You're the type of girl that, man, I could really see us being together for a long time. You're like, dude, I've known you for like five minutes. What are you talking about? <laughs> we haven't even ordered the appetizer yet, you know? Or guys will, will drop the love. I, I love you. Do you have any idea what that does to a girl? That is like, that is like fentanyl to a girl. It, it is both intoxicating or it's going to kill her. Because if you don't know how to handle that, you're going to destroy her. Are you with me on that? So she's thinking about him. Um, and then in verse 15, it says, How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. And so his, his heart is growing for her. Notice, though, what he sees and I appreciate this, what he doesn't see. Uh, he sees her eyes. He's commenting on her eyes. And there's a sense that uh, in many ways, you know, the eyes are the gateway to the soul. Uh, this also means, by the way, he's not looking at, her, at his phone. He's looking at her. He's engaging her. By the way, if you go on a date, please, please put your phone away. Please, I, I know, I know, I know. I'm old. I know it's 2023 and you're catching up on your peeps. But when you're at a date, just put that thing away. Let them know that they're the most important thing for you right there. And all of those alerts and all of those notifications, they will be there when you're done. It is incredibly devaluing and in many ways sad. My wife and I will be on a date and I'll look over and there's a young couple and they're both on their phones. I'm like, put it away because there's a richness in connection, right? I'm preaching a little bit, but you're, I think you understand what I'm saying. Now, verse uh, 16 how handsome you are, my beloved, and so pleasant. Indeed, our couch is luxuriant. The beams 
of our uh, houses are cedars, the rafters are cypresses. And uh, what I love about this text is that she accuses him of being pleasant. I just kind of like that. I mean, when's the last time, fellas, you've been accused of being pleasant? It just means he's kind, he's gracious, he's respectful. And so she goes, you're so pleasant. I love that. Uh, and in that, um, without looking at the text, by the way, how, how did she feel about herself physically in chapter one? Do you remember she says, I'm, I'm black but lovely? Right? Don't look at me because I'm sunburned. My mother's brothers were angry with me. They may be caretakers of the vineyard. I haven't been able to take care of my own vineyard. So this, this girl, as she's looked at herself, has not found herself to be exceedingly attractive, right? She says, I'm beautiful, but not, that's not the focal point. And yet, I want you to notice in chapter 2, verse 1, what she says of herself. She says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Now, she sees herself in this moment as being beautiful. The rose of Sharon is gorgeous. The lily of the valleys, gorgeous. Now, did she change physically from chapter 1 to chapter 2? Like, did, did, did something happen physically? No, what, what changed? Nothing but the presence of an affirming man. Nothing but the presence of an affirming man. She's still the same sunburned, hardworking woman she's ever been. But being around him, she just feels about herself in some ways lifted up, exalted, honored, treasured, appreciated, respected, um, even desired, but a lowercase d desired, not inappropriate, just he's taking initiative in her, to, to, with her, and she likes that. And in verse 2, he says, uh, like the lily among the thorns is my darling among the maidens. Like, again, unique among all the others. And then she, in verses 3 and following, kind of goes off. And she goes, look, like a tree among the, um, like an apple tree, rather, among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade, I took great delight. I sat down in his fruit, was sweet to his taste. He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. She now goes off on how he makes her feel. So she finds shade. There's all kinds of trees that she could find rest under. She finds rest under his in his shade, she feels refreshment and takes delight. She sits down. His fruit is sweet to her taste. It means that he is treating her in such a way that he is life-giving to her. He is bringing joy to her. He is bringing delight to her. And in verse 4, he's brought me to his bank while on his banner over me as love. You can tell a lot about the character of a man by the countenance of the woman that is with him. I've seen people come into church and she's holding his hand like following him around wherever he goes. You know, he's talking to his buddies and she's just kind of standing there. I'm like, oh, because mm -hmm. you can tell he's either jealous or controlling or angry. And she is in many ways uh, arm candy for him. A contrast, I'll see a couple walk in, they come in together and then they kind of be like, and they're gone. He's over with his homies. She's over with, with her homegirls or whatever. And they're doing their thing. And I'll watch them. And they'll catch eye contact. It's like, and then they're back with their friends. And I'm like, that's great. That's a man who's honoring his girl. Who allows her to have her friends. By the way, if you start to date somebody and they want you to leave your friends, they're the one who should be left. Because that's crazy. Why on earth would you leave your friends for some person you just started dating? A healthy relationship has trust and lets you go your separate ways. Now, as you watch this relationship so far, though, I mean, it, it's pretty incredible, right? I mean, it's getting pretty, get pretty exciting. They're going to know each other a little bit. And, and then verse 5 just seems out of place. Somebody read verse 5, will you? To stay in the praises, refreshed it with apples. Keep going. His left hand is under. Okay, this is out of place. What, why is it that you, so singing with raisin cakes? Refresh me with apples. Do you guys remember the story of Jacob and his multiple wives? And they're pimping him out for mandrakes. I get to sleep with him tonight. You take my mandrakes. You can have them tomorrow night. They're like, okay. Well, a mandrake, much like these, any fruit that had seed in them were considered a heightening of fertility and almost like an aphrodisiac. So when you look at this text, I mean, it's like they, he hasn't touched her. They haven't laid a hand on one another. And she says, refresh me with apples. Sustain me with, or sustain me with raising cakes, refresh me with apples, because I'm lovesick. May his left hand be under my head, and his right hand embrace me. And that's one of those intimate positions that you can be in. And she wants that. Now, 
If my wife was here right now, fellas, she's a hugger. She would want to hug all y'all. My preference would be that you give her the side hug. That's what I would prefer. Okay? If you're going to come in for a frontal, okay, I would prefer this move. But if you put your left hand behind her head and your right hand embrace her, we are obligated to fight. Like, we have to fight for her on and my own. Again, here's what I want you to see, fellas, or maybe better said, ladies. Something's happening in her life right now that she's going to be a little vulnerable here. She's wanting something and a, and a little insecure as to whether that's okay or not. She wants intimacy. She's leaning that way. She's uh, in some ways feeling her heart go that way. And this is a really, really strong and important moment in this book. And one of the reasons I mentioned figuring out who's speaking is so difficult. This one, I think, is where most translations miss it. Because in verse 7, uh, he speaks. And he says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. He speaks and says, those are good feelings, but not yet. Do not arouse or awaken love until the time is pleasing, until the time is right. Now, I've said a couple of times, ladies, that you really need to date a man. And here's another reason why you need to date a man versus a boy. A boy in this moment will see an opportunity. A man in this moment says, oh, sweetie, good feelings. Let's not do that. And, and if you can find a man that has that kind of godliness, if you can find a man who understands the vulnerability of the moment, you've got a good man. Uh, I would also say, though, and, and fellas, I'm sorry to dime us out like this, uh, but if in that moment he, he, he sees an opportunity and begins to reach for your pants, he's not ready for you. And I hope that wakes you up to go, what am I doing? Because he's obviously not the right type of guy. The right type of guy understands the vulnerability of a moment. Let me give you an illustration by way of what's happening here. You could argue, stereotypically, that men are like microwaves and women are like crockpots. Okay, here's what I mean. A, a man is visual. He sees something, whoa, it's gone, he moved on. Okay, it's, it's visual, it's, it's momentary, it's quick. He sees it, it's gone, he moved on. A, a woman uh, is like a crock pot. Now, I had a stepmom for, I don't know, about 13 months, and she was Italian and would cook the spaghetti sauce for like four days. And, and I'm fairly confident it was like a form of torture. I think she did it because she hated me, but regardless... The thing about a crock pot is it's, it's a slow cooking thing. Like you put something in it and then like go on vacation and it's just kind of cooking. But, but if you get those things hot, like really hot, and if for some reason it's beginning to boil over, you can unplug it, it's still going to boil over. You can take the lid off, it's still going to boil over. Because by that point, it's too late. Here's why that metaphor I think really works. On a bad day, what happens is you're in that situation, she has feelings, and... Uh, and he responds maybe to it. And then you go, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. And he goes, oh yeah, me either. No, of course not. No, let's pray. That's terrible. We should have never done that. But he just took note. Okay, I got that far. And then if he's not a godly man, he's going to push again later. And he'll push a little farther. And then you go, no, 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 he, right. No, we're not doing that. Let's pray. No, Lord, yes, we don't want to do that. But he sees I got a little farther. And at some point, he's going to get far enough that you're going to boil over. And you won't say no. And on a bad day, he knows it. So he keeps pushing. Are you, are you with me on that? So that's why, ladies, you've got to be very, very careful. By the way, you cannot get it back. You cannot get it back. Once you've crossed those boundaries, both men and women, you cannot get it back. But I'm so grateful for the gospel that meets us in our brokenness. That if anyone is in Christ, we're new creatures. All things pass away. New things have come. You cannot get it back, but you can't have a second first time. And you can say, you know what? I'm not going to keep giving myself away anymore. I'm going to take whatever I've got left. And I'm holding this one day for my spouse. And I will not behave the way I have behaved. I will not throw my emotions, my spiritual life, and my physical life towards intimacy with some person that I won't even know in a couple of years. No, no, I'm going to save that. I just want to encourage you to that. And I want you to live in grace and a lot of guilt in this because you all got stories, some more colorful than others. But look, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. 
And so let's embrace the gospel and let's make commitments to live new. Let's lean into this newness of life that we have through Christ and let's not go back to that old life. There are five problems, by the way, with premarital intimacy. Five things that it does that are negative, okay? Um, on top of, of course, just like, well, we get into outside of God's design, but the first one is this. It atrophies communication. It atrophies communication, meaning if you're in a relationship with somebody and conflict comes up and so you just make out and then you forget what you were fighting about, that, that'll get you for a little while. Uh, that, that'll get you by. But you're not really learning how to communicate, so it's atrophying communication. So if you ever like blow a knee out or whatnot, they cast up your leg, your muscles shrink up, that's atrophy. It's atrophying communication. You do not build a marriage on sex, you build it on the ability to communicate. And if you can't communicate or conflict well together, um, you're in trouble. So it atrophies communication. Second, it gives the illusion of health. It gives the illusion of health. I was making a fire the other night and uh, we got a little fire pit. I put a little lyre fluid on it. I lit that thing up. <laughs> and that thing was like, whoa, about burned my face off. Like, man, that's amazing. What happened in about 10 seconds? It burned out. And so what did I need to add? More, more, and more, and more, and more. And more and so it gives an illusion of help because people go how's your relationship you oh, it's awesome well no, no, the scent might be awesome the intimacy might be awesome at least in your mind it's awesome but that doesn't mean the relationship is right it's it's an illusion of health um third um it causes seen and unseen damage uh, it, it breaks something in your soul because god didn't make you for that god made you to protect that intimacy for a spouse so something inside breaks. And here's the thing. The first time's the hardest. Then it's easier. And then it's easier. And then it's easier. And, and this, the lie that Satan would love to tell you is that's, that's really where joy is. See, just like Genesis 3, God said, of, of all the trees of the garden, eat and eat freely. But of this one, don't eat it. If you eat it, you shall die, die. Satan goes, ah, come on. Did God really say you shouldn't eat from any tree? I mean... I mean, you're, you're really not going to die. And in fact, if you eat from it, you'll actually be like God, knowing good and evil. So really, God's holding out on you. And if God really loved you, he would let you eat it because that's where joy is. Life is found apart from God. It's the same thing that we're, that we're dealing with today regarding sexuality. We bought into the lie that life is found outside of God. And so it causes seen and unseen damage. Up fourth, very practically, harder to get out of a bad relationship. I hear ladies all the time, well, I mean, you know, if, no, we fight all the time. That's true. But, I mean, we slept together. So, I mean, I guess we probably should get married. I just go, two wrongs don't make a right. And as I said last night, the only thing worse than being single wishing you were married is being married wishing you were single. And I've just been doing this long enough now. I've seen couples that went ahead and got married. And I'm like, please don't. Like, don't. This is not healthy. They get married and now they're divorced and it's just not worth it. Um, and so it makes it harder to get out of a bad relationship. And then fifth and final, uh, it's outside of God's design. There's just no joy there. I'm not saying there's not a moment of satisfaction. All sin in a moment seems satisfying. But the wages of sin is death because it overpromises and underdelivers. So Adam and Eve were told, if you eat this, you'll be like God. So they hate it. Were they like God? No. No, not at all. In fact, they recognize their nakedness, they're ashamed, they cover, they hide. They get ejected from the garden. Death comes into the world. Corruption comes into the world. You and I sin today because of that. And so uh, it always overpromises and under delivers. And so let's talk a little bit about the proper context. She feels for him. His left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. Are those feelings wrong? Not at all. Those feelings are given to you by God. God made you as a sexual being. That by God's grace, you would be fruitful and multiply one day, okay? But uh, the issue is context. So let's, let's take a fire metaphor for a moment. If I took this couch right here and I threw some wood on it, I threw some paper on it, I got that lighter fluid and squirted on it, and I threw a match, what would happen? That thing would blow up, right? And, and initially, it might be kind of fun. Oh, dude, it's crazy. It's a couch fire. Like, that is nuts. But, but after a while, um, you're going to realize you can't control that. Like, that, that's not really designed. A couch is not designed to handle that. It's going to go to that couch, to that couch, up the beams, and burn this whole place down. Why? Because that's not the proper context. 
It's not to say the, the wood is evil or the fire is evil. It's not to say the flame itself is evil. It's just to say it's not the right context. Now, if I take that same wood, that same paper, that same lighter fluid, that same fire, and I put it in there, that's a different story. Why? Because that's designed to handle it. If you, you light that fire in there, you'll wear a house with it. You light that fire in there, it becomes something that's a source of life, not death. Are you with me? I don't, I'm frustrated in some ways with the youth group message of don't have sex until you're married. And I get what they're saying, but I need a little bit more information as to why. That's why. Don't because God's way is better, and I'll show you in chapter 4. We'll, we'll do the honeymoon night tomorrow morning. But, but also, that's not meant to handle that heat, and it will destroy everything you love. And it's out of your control. You cannot control the consequences of sin. And so if you start lighting those fires... They will jump what you think is, is you know, it will move beyond what you think is kind of fun and, and it will destroy everything. Are you with me on that? So regarding dating, dating community, date in public. Um, I mentioned already as we sort of closed the dating portion, uh, for some of you, you're like, dude, where, where was this when I was a freshman in high school? Like, I wish I would have learned this then because I crossed all these boundaries. And I just want to remind you, I'm so thankful uh, you know, First John says, if we claim to have fellowship, or if we say we have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we are without sin, uh, we, are, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So look, I, I don't really care where you've been per se. I grieve with you. If you're living in some ashes right now, I'm more interested in where are we going? And I just want to, I just want to kind of maybe, maybe invite us into a different way moving forward. Good with that? All right. Well, let's talk about courtship, shall we? How are we doing on time? All right. You guys good? All right. We'll move quick. So courtship. Uh, what happens um, when a dating relationship becomes dating plural, where it becomes verb, multiple verbs, been dating for a while, uh, and I just think uh, that the rules need to change, okay? The, the expectations, the desired outcome changes in courtship. Before we cover courtship, though, let me do a little preemptive work on this. couple just hot sports opinions. One, uh, let me just make a quick statement about guy-girl friendships. Um, this program's unique because you, you do get to connect with a lot of people from the opposite sex, which is great. Uh, I just want to caution you that in the, the real world, uh, you have to be careful with that. And you say, well, I don't have feelings for so-and-so. Yeah, but they might. And if you're not mindful of it, um, her name was Kennelly Broom. Kennelly was a gal that when I was in Denton, before I started dating my wife, she and I were friends. She liked to dance. I liked to dance. She liked to have fun. I liked to have fun. I'm like, hey, let's just be friends. Well, little did I know she had feelings for me. And that's what happens. God made us um, to have chemistry together. A formula would be this time plus communication equals intimacy. And so if you're a uh, guy, girl, friends, just be careful that there's not sparks on one side or the other. Second, uh, what about long-term relationships? Like I hear people go, yeah, I've, you know, we started dating as freshmen in high school. Like my daughter is a, started dating as a sophomore. I'm like, oh, <laughs> because it's a tractor pull. Are you familiar with what a tractor pull is? So it's a race where this uh, like tractor, whatever, has a trailer that has a weight on the back end. And so it starts going down the track. And as it's going down the track, that weight very quickly moves to the front of the trailer until it stops. And so it just means it gets heavier and heavier and heavier as it goes. So you can keep a relationship shallow emotionally, shallow spiritually, shallow intimacy in a moment. But over years, the natural gravitational pull is to intimate. So you just have to be careful in terms of long-term relationships. Um, I, I share sometimes it's kind of like treading water, holding a bowling ball. Like you could do it for a little bit, but I mean, at some point it's going to become too much. And then maybe the third thing, just by way of caution, is relational addiction. It's a thing, but it's, it's, it's a thing in a very unique way in that if you've always had a relationship, like if you break up and you're like shaking because you got to find somebody else to date or you already had somebody else lined up, not going to just pray about that. Because in, until you're fully content being you, uh, you'll never be able to serve another. Because if, if you're a relational addict, it, it really means that there's something inside of you that's lacking 
and you need someone to fill it, which means it's a take relationship. It's not a give. And one of the greatest gifts, and maybe this program is doing that for you, one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself is just being single. Because if you can be single, then you can be a life-giving relationship giver one day. All right, courtship. So the period uh, that a couple walks through that develops now a romantic relationship towards marriage. This is not just Christian dating, by the way. That's why I don't like the term. Because Christian's like, no, I don't date, I just court. I'm like, okay, I don't mean it like that. What I mean is you, you date and then you find somebody you really like and you think, hey, I think this might have some long-term potential. I want to move intentionally towards marriage. Call it whatever you want to call it. Call it serious dating. Call it, I don't care. Just don't call it dating. Because dating is casual. It's non-escalating. It's non-emotional. And a courtship relationship is the opposite of that. Right? Still not physical, but the point is it's moving that way. You're allowing the sliders to go towards intimate, which means you officially said, okay, let's start a process. You don't oops your way into it, at least hopefully not after hearing this. Starting chapter 2, verses 8 and following. Will someone read verses 8 and following for me, please? And the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping over the mountains to the bottom of the hills. I beloved left with the over young there. Behold, there he's been under a wall. Gazing through the windows, looking free. Flash, yeah. Made a rod and I let my beautiful wine come away. Ah, uh, for behold, the winter's past foot. Ah, uh, the rays over and gone. The flower of pure on the earth, the town of Sini has gone. And the voice of the turtle bell is heard in our land. The fig tree rip, uh, rip into space, and the wines are blossom. They give forth fresh fragrance. They rise back. Perfect. So what do you see? Other than he's a bit of a stalker, okay? And other than that, yeah, what do you see? Come away. Come away. Yeah, he's inviting her to join him. Yeah. What time of year is it? What makes you say that? Why spring? Winter is or the rain are gone and the flowers being had. Yeah. So if you think about a, a new relationship, it's life-giving. It's fragrant. It's exciting spring, new life in the air. And they're, they're developing this relationship and it looks like beginning to spend time together. Just a side note on that, um, it looks like they make each other better. Do you, do you kind of get that feeling? Like this is really good for both of them. Um, have you ever been in a re relationship where you fight all the time? Oh, we just fight all the time. Hey, think about that for a minute. Or maybe one of your friends was in a relationship we're all, it seems like, like every couple of weeks, they're just in this like knockdown drag out fight. Have you ever just thought, what are you doing? Like, is that, is that what you want for the rest of your life? Cause you're not going to change him and he's not going to change you. And so, I mean, obviously there's like oil and water. Like why, why are you in a bad relationship? It doesn't make sense. Interesting. By the way, you know, one of the ways you fix a bad relationship, intimacy, because if you could be intimate, I say fix air quotes. If you could be intimate, it seems like it's better than it is, right? And so uh, if you're fighting all the time, if it's not life-giving, uh, break up, walk away, find somebody else. Um, if it's hard and it's always complex, there's somebody better for you. Now, this couple, though, is in the middle of what seems to be some sort of springtime bliss. Like they are delighting in each other. They're having a great time. They're hanging out. It's spring. It's life-giving. And then comes verse 14, and something seems strange. It says, oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your form and let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. Where is she? In this text, verse 14, where, where is she? Somebody else. Clefts of the rocks. Not dissing you, you just are answering a lot, that I want other people to play a little bit. Where is she? If you don't answer, I'm going to make JT answer again. <laughs> Say it again. He's in some cliff. What else do you see? Paint the picture. In a cranny. Yeah. Do you kind of get the idea she's almost hiding? Okay. It, it seems like she's hiding and then he's calling to her. The question is, why is she hiding? Uh, and what is she, what is she afraid of? I thought this was a really good relationship. Well, remember I talked about the, the scale. If, if you're a three fellow, she's a five. If you're a five, she's a seven. If you're a seven, she bought the dress. Uh, keep that in mind. Also keep what happened uh, in chapter two in mind of let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. 
uh, th this girl is now vulnerable. She's come after this guy. She's like made a pass at this guy. She's vulnerable. She likes him and he likes her. This thing's got trajectory written all over it. And she's like, oh my gosh, like this is serious. And so she's, she's hiding. And the reason she's hiding is, uh, is she's wondering in this moment if he's going to do something in verse 15. Notice it says, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. Now, I didn't know anything about this until I, I planted uh, some vines. And they actually have little flowers. I don't know if you knew that or not. Tiny little things, but little flowers that turn into the grapes. And if you have a vineyard and little critters of some sort come in and nibble on those flowers, that it won't produce the kind of fruit that that vineyard should have. And so you have to protect it. You have to work hard to keep the pests off of it. You have to keep the wall up. You have to spray and make sure nothing there is hindering. You have to do a lot of work to make sure you can have the kind of fruit that you could if you put the effort in. So what is she asking? Like, look, are, are, you, are you really as good as I think you are? Are you really willing to do the work in our relationship? Because I'm a little nervous. Because I'm kind of moving this way. And, and if you're not willing to do what I think you're willing to do, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in trouble here. Do, do you see it? And so uh, we don't know. What we see him called to her, by the way. He's not mad at her in verse 14. He just says, hey, look, at, um, let me see your form. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your form is lovely. He just calls to her. It's very sweet, very gracious. Uh, we don't know how he answers her after verse 15. But if you look at verse 16, whatever it is he said, she likes it. So my beloved is mine and I'm his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Until the cool of the day when the shadows flee away, Turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of Bether. Now, this one's weird. So when is the cool of the day when the shadows flee away? Does. Probably in the morning when the sun comes up, cool of the day, shadows, the darkness flees away. Uh, and she says to him, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of Bether. Now, you're, you're studying some... Israeli geography, I would assume, yeah, for your trip. Where are the mountains of Bether? They don't exist. Okay, there's no, there's no mountains called Bether. The word Bathar in Hebrew means to cut or to separate. It literally is a reference to twin peaks. She says to him, uh, come on, beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the twin peaks all night long. She's calling him to her body. It is as intimate as the previous uh, section, if not more. It gets more. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, she's going to get the dude by the hand and walk him into mom's bedroom. Like, she is, like, ready to go. Not just sexually ready to go, but, like, she, this is her guy. She brings him home and introduces him to their parents or her parents. Girls, you don't bring some loser home to your parents. I mean, if you come home with a boy, like, mom, dad, Billy, Billy, mom, dad, like, like this is the guy kind of thing. Now, what I want you to notice is it's, it's moving very, very intimately. And yet, look at verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. Does it look familiar? I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, by the hinds of the field, and you do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. Same exact thing that he said in the dating context. He says it again. By the way, there's not a dude in here who is like, man, I want that kind of response. I want that kind of woman. Like, I would love to have a woman who's that into me. Can I just be candid with you, fellas? That is earned. It is not deserved. That is a privilege. It is not a right. Why does she treat him like that? Because of the way he has treated her. She's responding to godliness. Now, you could make the argument that her response to him is outside of the boundaries of godliness. She is indeed very vulnerable in this regard. And yet, that's why you need to make sure you, you date in seriously date or court the right type of person because now twice he has shut that down he said do not arouse or awaken love and tell us Jesus. beautiful beautiful picture um and at this point this guy's not laid a glove on this lady it has been a beautiful godly relationship not physical but you can see it moving that way so a couple things let's talk courtship and then we'll wrap up um a couple things that you need to do preliminar preliminarily before you move into courtship Okay, one, you got to make sure you're ready. So, fellas, if you're still looking at porn, you're not ready. By the way, can, can I just make a comment about pornography? 
uh, it is a secret assassin to the souls of men. And if you fellas are engaging in uh, using pornography, I want you to walk in light with that. Bring that out to other people. Bring that out to, to uh, some of your leaders. Uh, first of all, bring it to the Lord. Uh, it, is, it is outside of God's design for you to look at pornography. Your eyes should be for your wife and your wife alone. You should be satisfied always with the breasts of the wife of your youth. And if you're looking at anybody else other than your wife, uh, that's adultery. So it, it is as serious as adultery. And so I, I share that not by way of rebuke, but by way of loving invitation. Psalm 141.5 says, Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil on my head. Do not let my head ref refuse it. I, I pray that you take that as smiting you in kindness. Until you deal with the pornography issue, you will not be ready for a dating relationship. Okay? Because... If you're looking at those images, you will always be comparing. And if you're looking at those images, you will probably be pushing her physical boundaries. And you need to respect her enough to not date her until you've dealt with that. Amen? Amen. I'd like to say it's just the fellas too, but ladies, if the shoe fits, wear it. Okay. Um, so make sure you're ready. Second is, um, have you watched this person over time? Okay. Watch this person over time. In Genesis 24, when Abraham sends Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac, he goes to the well. By the way, you can find a good spouse at the well. I'm just saying. It's down the hill in Fresno. Come to us. And, uh, and it says that uh, she comes and he says, uh, help me find a servant, you know, for my, for my, uh, my master Isaac. And he says, um, so let me see if this woman comes and says, well, I'll give you some water. I'll water your camels. And it just says he gazes at her in silence to see if she would do what she said she would do. Just watch someone over time. Just watch someone over time. Uh, make sure the relationship's life-giving. And then if you're ready and you've watched over time and it's life-giving, then you move into courtship. And, and this is where I think, fellas, uh, we need you to step up. And uh, I'm going to walk through just a real quick process of courtship very quickly um, and just a step-by-step -step process, fellas, that I think you need to initiate on. And if you do this right, every step of the way, you say to the girl, here's where I'm at, here's what I feel, this is what I would like to do, are you okay with that? And all she has to say is, yeah, I'm good with that. She can say more if she wants, but she's not obligated to say anything. So this isn't like, well, I really like you. Do you like me? That is so juvenile. Just go, hey, this is how I feel. These are my intentions. This is the step I'd like to take. Are you okay with that? All right, it starts with this. A declaration of intentions to pursue a friendship, an intentional friendship. of saying, hey, we've hung out in groups. We've hung out, you know, in community and in public. But there's something happening here. Would you be okay if you and I spent time together, specifically just cultivating a friendship together? And uh, ladies, if you feel good with that, uh, then you just say, okay. And you, again, you could say more. And by the way, if she says no, don't be a stalker. She said no, strike out. You learn a lesson, go home, no problem. Don't, don't stalk her, don't beg her. Don't try to talk her into it. Just be a man and walk away. No harm, no foul, right? Um, if you don't ask, you never know, okay? So it's a declaration of intentions for friendship. Second, declaration of intentions for exclusivity. Meaning, hey, we spent time in groups, we spent time in public, but I, I, I'd like to really pursue this, um, maybe just you and I. And I just want to make sure you'd be okay with that. Now, I am a fan of talking to some authority in her life before you do that. Might be your dad. Uh, but truthfully, in this culture, it might not be your dad, it might be your pastor. But I would just go to somebody, hey, I'd, I'd like to take this step. I'd like to walk in light in this relationship. I'd like to give you, as an authority in your life, permission to ask me whatever questions you'd like. Here's what I'm committing to. I'm going to honor her. I'm going to respect her. I'm going to treat her as a sister in Christ in all purity. I just want to make sure that's okay with you. Is there any, any red flag in me or any, any red flag in her? Otherwise, I'd like to pursue it. Boom. Okay, so that's the second step. Then... Uh, you would go to the third, which is discovery. Discovery is where you catch the foxes, you have some disclosure, you talk about your past. I want you to notice something, by the way. I don't think you need to talk about your past until you're in a courtship relationship. I don't think the first date over Appies is the place to talk about your previous sexual encounters. That's, that's, not, that's not what that date is for, okay? Just enjoy the date, keep that one locked up for now, okay? But at some point, they need to know. Uh, I remember I, uh, I was dating a gal and I was very serious with her. She was the fancy one. 
And uh, I told her about my past and she cried. And she said, I can't believe God did this to me. Uh, I've been pure all my life and I fell in love with a guy like you. I was crushed. I literally, ginormous dude, weeping on the floor. I was so shamed by that girl. Um, now it's strange because she's friends with my wife, which is so weird. But that's a testament to my wife. I said the same thing to my wife years later. And she stopped me mid set. She goes, I'm really not concerned with where you've been. I know who you are. And that's the man I fall in love with. And I was like, so. But, but you need to have that conversation. Because for some people, it's important. For some people, they're like, no, 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 I'm, I, don't, I don't want any baggage. You just need to know what you're getting into, by the way. And so that's what discovery is, where you talk about the deeper issues, et cetera. Um, with that, by the way, I'm not a fan of details. I don't think details are helpful. So my wife has a past. And uh, at one point, she started to tell me details. I don't want to know. Like, I don't, I don't need to know that. Because I'll probably want to go choke a dude, okay? So don't tell me, and I will tell you. She asked me one time, she's like, hey, such and so, uh, were you, were you, you know, inappropriate with such and so who comes to our church? And I'm like, you know what? I, I could tell you that if you really want to know, no secrets, I'll tell you. But here's the question I want you to answer. Do you think that's good for our marriage? If it's good for our marriage, I will tell you everything. I don't think it is. And she can say, yes, probably not. And so we, we left that, but that, I, I don't think details are helpful. Fourth step is a declaration of intentions, moving to marriage. This is where you go ask for the blessing. So if you didn't talk to an authority before you go here, do not be the boy or boy, sorry, didn't mean to insult you. Do not be the young man who proposes to the girl and then asks her dad. Don't do that. As a dad of daughters, don't do that. Go to the dad. Why? Uh, it, it engages them in the process. And so go and you ask. Uh, my wife's from Durant, Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma, and I went and met with her dad, Gary Shipman. If, you, if you're a, a football fan, the Oklahoma State mascot, uh, Pistol Pete, I think is his name. That is my stepdad or my uh, father-in-law brother. That is my father-in-law. Hey, Scott Black Dish. He's a sweet old country boy. He, he does horse trainers. He can't hear. And I'm saying this respectfully. If he was here, I would say this. I've said this to his face. And, and I go to him and I go, hey, Gary, I just want to know I love your daughter. I just love to have your, your blessing to, to marry your daughter. He goes, well, if it's good enough for her, you're good enough for me. I was like, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> but I told her, hey, let's go to Oklahoma. I'd like to talk to your parents. I'd like to get their blessing. So let's, let's go. And we went and I said, I'm going to go take your parents for a walk. I'm going to ask for their blessing. And then I came back and I said, Hey, I just want you to know, I asked for their blessing. They said, yes. And I said, I've done the best I could in this relationship to communicate early and often exactly where we stand. By the way, side note on that. What you're trying to do fellas is lead in such a way that she's never confused. Girls, have you ever been in a relationship? You'd be like, oh my gosh, what's going on with you and so-and-so? You're like, I don't, I kind of don't know. It ought never be like that. You ought to know exactly where you stand, not because you stalked him on Instagram, but because he told you. He led out every step of the way. And so I came back to the house. I go, hey, just so you know, I've done my best to communicate early and often. The next communication you hear from me is an engagement. I won't tell you when and I won't tell you how. Are you okay with that? She said, yes. And so we moved on. Final one, of course, as you can see coming is engagement. And that's, uh, that's where you're entering into some really good fine tuning in the marriage. It doesn't mean you're married, by the way. I delight when engaged couples break up. And you go, that's so jacked. Why do you delight? Because otherwise they're going to be young married couples who divorce. And I'd much rather see a breakup. Yeah, you lost some down payment on a reception home. Yeah, it's a little embarrassing because you set out the invitations. It's a, lot, it's a lot better than going through years of divorce counseling and then ending up divorce. So um, engagement, fine-tuning, prepping for marriage. Um, now, I, I'll just say this as I close. It, it's a high bar. I, I acknowledge that, especially for the men. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's really high uh, for us as fellas, but it can be done. It can be done. And when it's done right, boy, it is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, when are you ready to do that? You know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's maturity. It's not age, right? So I've seen 50-year-old guys who aren't ready. I've also seen some young adults who are. You, you've got to be the judge of that. And, uh, and in that, I just think it's, it's about maturity. It's about season of life, making sure you're in a place where you can actually carry that kind of load. Um, it seems like a ton of work, but remember, we're trying to break cycles. Long ingrained cultural cycles that have set us up for failure. 
And so we're trying to do something a little bit different. So that's a, a different perspective on courtship. All right. Questions, thoughts on that? I know we covered a mouthful. I appreciate the grace. I know it's late. Thank you. Yeah. No. What? Any books uh, I'd recommend on dating? No. I'm sure there's some out there. The Shri, the Song of Solomon. Yeah. Um, this sounds trite. Read, read the Song of Solomon. Read your Bible. Um, become the right type of person. Focus on being discipled. Walk with Jesus. You know, um, if you do that, then, then it's kind of like seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things are kind of added to you as well. It all just kind of comes together if Christ is the focus. Look, at, if you and he are both pursuing Christ, then, then you get closer together over time. That's beautiful. Uh, if at any point he deviates, kick him to the curb. Do not go rescue him. It just means, all right, Lord, then I don't know what you have for